Good morning and welcome uh, to this, the second meeting of 2015 of the European and External Relations Committee. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones are switched off because um, they interfere with um, our electronic equipment, um, broadcast equipment. Um, two agenda items this morning. The first agenda item is looking at the EU strategy and um, I'd uh, have the great pleasure in, in, in welcoming back to Scotland and, and for the first time to this committee, uh, Jacqueline Miner, who is the head of the European Commission's representation in the United Kingdom, who will be giving us evidence this morning on the European Commission work programme. Uh, welcome to, to committee, uh, Jacqueline, and I believe you've got a short opening statement. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you very much for this invitation. It's a great pleasure to be able to uh, meet the committee formally. Uh, and I know that you're in constant touch with our office here in Scotland, and I'd just like to take the opportunity to reiterate that they stand ready to assist you in any way they can uh, with information. Um, what I had planned to do was to speak briefly to um, perhaps some changes in the way that the Commission, uh, in its new formation, following the appointment of uh, President Juncker and his team of commissioners, how it intends to go about business in the next five years, uh, and then briefly uh, refer to a number of the key initiatives, rather than running through the entire work program, because I have had the advantage of seeing uh, the detailed notes provided by your secretariat and the responses to them. So obviously you're quite familiar uh, with the content of the work program. Um, if you cast your minds back to May 2014, uh, the Europa European Parliament election slogan was, this time it's different. And I think the question that still probably lingers in people's minds is, is it really different? Um, and if so, how? But I think in, in many ways it has been different. Uh, the appointment of President Juncker uh, did emerge as a result of the European elections. He was the candidate put forward by uh, the largest, the, the, the political group that emerged as the largest in the European Parliament, and that uh, argument eventually carried the day in the Council of Ministers. And then when you look at uh, the fe his fellow commissioners, uh, the other men and women appointed to serve uh, in his college, you see that there are five former prime ministers, four deputy prime ministers, and 19 former ministers. And I think that's a mark of the importance that member states now accord uh, to their representatives or, or to the, the persons that they appoint uh, to the European Commission. The average age is 49, which is younger uh, than many governments. And in particular, if you look at the vice presidents, uh, and I'll come back to the vice presidents, their average age is 43, which is a quite significant change from previous commissions. President Juncker has made it clear that he intends his commission to be more political, more top-down, and more focused. He has talked about being big on the big things, smaller and more modest on the smaller things. That was in his own personal political manifesto that he presented to the European Parliament before they endorsed his appointment. Uh, and it is, I think, uh, a red thread that runs through all of the decisions that have been taken so far about the Commission's working methods and which underpins the work programme for 2015. What, do we, what does he mean by more political, more top-down, more focused? Well, I think it means that they will, they will really uh, address the key challenge for Europe, which is jobs, competitiveness and growth. And that is reflected in the 10 priorities which uh, President Juncker put to the European Parliament. I think it also means, and this again I think you can see reflected in the work programme for 2015, that the Commission has understood the message which certainly some um, national politicians have communicated to it and which probably is implicit in the outcome of the European elections that uh, the European Union has become too intrusive in terms of 
the rules and regulations it makes and their impact on the daily lives of citizens. So I think there is a determination to address that concern. How has that been done in the structure of the Commission? Well, um, there are six vice presidents and the high representative. The high representative is, um, by reason of her office, necessarily a, a, a vice president. And these vice presidents, contrary to previous practice, have a real delegation of powers. In former commissions, um, the, the title of vice president was mainly honorific. Um, it was based on seniority. And um, the main responsibility attaching to being a vice president was to deputize for the president of the commission should he be absent from meetings. Here, what we have seen is real power given to vice presidents to coordinate their areas of responsibility and um, to lead project teams on key legislative and other initiatives. And uh, you can see that the choice of vice presidents was dictated by, by prior political office. Uh, all of those originally nominated were former prime ministers. One, one of those originally nominated did not survive the hearings in the European Parliament. And uh, Commissioner Chevchevich, who is now serving for his second time, uh, was appointed to replace her. I think it's also worthy of note that when they were appointed, um, the words for now were attached to the announcement of their appointment, which carries with it the possibility that at some time in this commission, there will be a reshuffle, which is not the practice or has never been the practice of commissions so far. So there is an interesting prospect that at some time it may be that portfolios are changed, that the, the overall distribution of files is reshaped. And I think one effect of having created those vice presidents is that um, there are now really substantial, substantial portfolios for the other commissioners, the so-called team commissioners, uh, with 28 members of the commission, 26 once you take out the president and the high representative. It becomes quite difficult, I think, to ensure that each of them has a really substantial and, and serious job. But by having created um, vice presidents and, and team commissioners, I think that has been one of the beneficial side effects. And <clears throat> the project teams are variable, so um, there's no permanent reporting lines between team commissioners and vice presidents. It will depend upon the initiative. Everybody can be drawn into uh, the realm of a particular vice president for a particular initiative. I'd also um, like to emphasize the role of the first vice president, Franz Timmermans, who was formerly the Dutch deputy prime minister and foreign minister, who has been given a very special responsibility for better regulation, for agenda planning, and for relationships with national parliaments and the European Parliament. I think he will be a key interlocutor for uh, the United Kingdom, um, he was very much aligned with the views, I think, across the political spectrum here in the United Kingdom as to the need for change within the European Union uh, before he was appointed to the Commission. And his role will be very much to make sure that nothing gets on to the Commission agenda which has not been thoroughly impact assessed, which has not been tested for its impact in terms of regulatory burden and administrative cost. And there have been some changes already in the way the Commission goes about um, its assessment of impacts prior to tabling proposals. I think you can see his influence in the shape of the work programme. There are 25, uh, sorry, 23 items on the work programme compared with an average of 129 items over each of the years of the Barroso Commission. Uh, and I think he's very much um, part of the Commission's thinking on discontinuity, <clears throat> the decision to withdraw a number of proposals, up to 80 proposals, and the determination to continue to pursue the refit process, um, which is the, the better regulation program. And finally, the, the other thing I would say, perhaps, um, is 
it's when one looks at the allocation of portfolios, I think that surprised a number of commentators in that often <coughs> the prior tradition had been that countries with an obvious and particular interest in certain policy areas, um, their representatives, their member of the commission was not given that portfolio. But we have seen with the appointment of Jonathan Hill um, that the United Kingdom uh, commissioner has been given responsibility for financial stability and financial markets. So, so the program, may, may I just pick out one or two things which I think are significant, and then, but obviously I stand ready to answer questions on anything. I think in terms of jobs and growth, uh, the most important thing is something which has already been tabled, namely the investment package, uh, the idea of using commission funds uh, in a more smart fashion than has previously been the case, whereas a lot of commission funding uh, to date has taken the form of grants, co-financing of, of projects. Uh, the idea of the investment package is to make use of that funding uh, to create a guarantee fund which would leverage and crowd in uh, private sector investment for key infrastructure uh, and research projects. And the plan is to deliver over 300 billion euros of growth um, heavy intensive projects. I think other things which will be clearly of interest to the United Kingdom um, and which is certainly going to appear in the, the early months of this year the digital single market, um, the, the UK, UK businesses have a key role in the, uh, the online internal market. They have an inbuilt advantage by way of language because most of the internet speaks English. And it's very much in, in the interest of the British economy that the digital single market should become a greater reality than it presently is. So that package, I think we can expect to see reforms to copyright, uh, to align copyright rules with consumer expectations quite surprising, I think, to many consumers that when they travel abroad, um, they're not able to make use of the internet in the same way. Um, famously, for, for Brits, iPlayer doesn't work once you leave these shores. Um, the correlative of that is, I think, as well, aside from copyright, that you need a consumer protection regime that works in the digital environment the consumer protection rules which offer consumers guarantees when they're buying cross-border at the moment are really um, conceived in terms of tangible goods. So we need to think about how they'd work for intangible services, software, music downloads, and so on. And there are some infrastructure questions there. We'll very shortly be seeing um, the energy package um, I think within the next few weeks, you'll see the energy union package tabled. It will consist of a number of things, uh, a document on um, the energy union as such with a focus on energy security. How are we going to ensure that the European Union uh, retains its autonomy or at least secures as far as possible its autonomy in energy? Uh, it will also um, relate to the completion of the internal market decarbonisation, better energy efficiency and investment in research and, and development of alternative energy sources. Um, the single market, no, the work will press on with the single market. That won't necessarily be legislative. There may be some selective legislative proposals, I think, in relation to business services, again an area in which uh, the UK has uh, significant interest given our service-based economy. Capital Markets Union, the, the project which Lord Hill um, will be very prominent in. How can we now, having had five years of restructuring, re-regulating the financial markets, ensure that they work to support the real economy? How can we connect uh, the capital, which everyone says is available within the European Union, with the businesses who need it to grow and to scale up? And I think we'll be seeing a consultation document again um, around Easter. And um, finally, perhaps um, on trade, uh, again, 
a British priority, um, there will be a big push to conclude uh, the discussions and the negotiations on the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. And you will have seen that last week, um, in a bid to encourage transparency, the Commission released all its uh, negotiating objectives. It's, it released documents um, encapsulating its negotiating objectives and also some of the draft texts which it has submitted to the American side. And then later last week, it also released the results of the consultation on investor state dispute settlement, uh, which has become a very contentious issue in the context of TTIP. So that's really just a few highlights. Um, but as I say, I'm happy, insofar as I can, to reply to questions on the work program or any more general questions that you might have on commission policy and working methods. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very uh, detailed um, uh, opening statement for us in, in many areas that this committee has been taking a very, very keen interest in and TTIP being one of those. Um, a quick opening question that I have for you is around about the political makeup of the current European Parliament and what kind of influence you maybe foresee and maybe any um, you know, measures that, that the Commission are looking at to ensure that that political influence is in a positive way and, and, and um, enhances the, the Commission's work programme uh, um, rather than hold it back. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, the composition of the Parliament, of course, changed as a result of the elections. And um, what you have are a number of parties, political groupings, um, variously described, <clears throat> and perhaps the most neutral way is edge uh, parties, um, parties who are not or have not so far been of the mainstream. Um, I think it's a little early to speculate what impact that will have in practice on the way in which the Parliament works. There are two schools of thought. One is um, that it will make the work of the Parliament more difficult because there will be um, less party discipline. Uh, in the previous Parliament, the outgoing Parliament, um, it was normally possible to assemble a majority for a legislative member a measure by um, accumulating the support of one of the two largest political groups, either the EPP or uh, the socialist group, and the swing group in the middle, the European Liberals. Um, it's not so clear that that will be a way forward in the new parliament. Um, and certainly the first signs are that it will be difficult to assemble majorities because on the vote on the work programme last week, it wasn't possible for the parliament to pass a resolution. There were two conflicting blocking minorities. On the other hand, I think when it comes to the detail of uh, co-decision legislative work, the experience of the parliament has always been that it is... Um, a body that moves forwards largely by consensus. So the detailed working committee often results in an overwhelming vote of the committee or compromise amendments where uh, different groups can come together. Um, that may not always be optimal in terms of legislative clarity or drafting, uh, but it does result in progress in terms of the legislative procedure. The other thing which the Commission is proposing is the conclusion of an interinstitutional agreement with both the Council and the Parliament, uh, whereby there would be more forward planning uh, of the legislative agenda, so that at an early stage both the, the, the Member States in Council and uh, the European Parliament represented by its Bureau would um, agree with the Commission what the legislative priorities were and would make parliamentary time and resources available to ensure their rapid progress through the legislative procedure. Okay. I think the whole political makeup um, uh, situation in, in the European Parliament will be watched with some 
interest across uh, all member states, but uh, quite possibly uh, a bit more uh, in the UK and, and Scotland too. Um, so on, on, on that, what bigger, how big an impediment would be a campaign for an in-and-out referendum um, on the UK's position uh, in, in the European Union? How, I know it's a very political question, <laughs> but um, you know, in the backdrop of you know, yeah. a more, um, I'll be diplomatic, diversified um, political makeup of the of the, the European Parliament. What then additional impact would would a campaign for a referendum have have on the programme? Well, let me say as a, a preliminary remark, the Commission is entirely neutral in terms of whether a referendum is desirable or not. That is a matter for the British government and the British people. And, of course, the Commission would respect the democratic um, expression uh, of their um, views. That does sound very familiar, but we'll leave yeah. it at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's a well-honed phrase. Um, in practical terms, I think, first of all, we have to know what are the reforms um, that a British government would seek before returning to put the question to the electorate in the form of a referendum. Um, there have been various statements made in various ways by the Prime Minister acting as leader of the Conservative Party, but we haven't yet, for understandable reasons, seen a detailed negotiating agenda. The next question is, having seen that, how much of those reforms are either already underway, and I have referred to a number of things which I think have appeared in some of the references to reform. So completing the single market, the digital single market, progressing with energy union, yeah. external trade policy. Those are already underway. Um, some of them require legislation. Some of them don't. Um, if evidence of legislative progress is required, then that links back to your earlier question as to how effective and how efficient um, the institutions will be in their, in their new composition. The big question, of course, um, will be whether the British government will be seeking treaty change. And treaty change um, is not an easy thing to achieve at European level. It requires a constitutional uh, convention, uh, which normally takes some time. Um, the Lisbon Treaty does provide for simplified procedures for minor changes to the treaty. But significant change would then have to be ratified by all the member states according to their normal parliamentary procedures, and in some member states, by referendums. Uh, so I think there... Um, the situation is obviously not one which is easy to achieve in the short term. Um, so partly it's the European Parliament, partly it would be other national parliaments who would have a say. OK, I'll let that one hang and I'll go to my colleague, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy McGregor. Thanks very much. Um, well, my first question is to do with the, um, the priorities uh, outlined by... Jean Claude Juncker, um, and he does make uh, he, he makes a statement that um, if Europe invests more, Europe will be more prosperous. Um, and then he talks about uh, the investment plan we're putting forward today um, is an ambitious and new way of boosting investment without creating new debt. Um, how how can you invest more without increasing debt? That's my first question. And the, the second question is, how will this policy, overarching policy, particularly on broadband, impact on Scotland? Because I represent the Highlands and Islands of Scotland, and I have to tell you that the, the, the broadband that we have there in, in, in various areas is practically non-existent. And I believe that, for example, Slovenia has far better connectivity. Um, how can we in the Highlands and Islands gain something from um, this overarching policy on, on, on broadband? 
And uh, that's my first question. I've got another question after that, Kameen, if that's all right. Thank you. Well, um, investing more without increasing debt. Um, I think President Juncker was referring, obviously, to public debt there, to, to the need for fiscal consolidation. So the investment package is posited on um, a better use of available funds. Uh, the Commission typically um, has used those parts of the European budget uh, at its disposal previously to co-finance by way of grant. What it is planning to do with the European uh, Fund for uh, Strategic Investment is to make use of the funding at its disposal and some of the funds which are available to the European Investment Bank to fund a guarantee. And the guarantee would then leverage in private sector investment to projects which would otherwise not have found investment from the private sector. Uh, so the idea is that there is a guarantee fund um, of uh, 8 million invested from European funds. That, that leverages up to 16 million of guarantee on a, on a double basis. You deposit 18 million, uh, sorry, 8 million, but it becomes 16 million guarantee. And uh, the remaining five, uh, 8 million... I, uh, Sorry, my maths are not my strong point. Seven million from the investment bank. So there's a 23 million guarantee fund that, on the basis of prior experience of the European Investment Bank, will enable them to secure private sector investment of about 315 billion euro. And that will then be invested in eligible projects, which could be infrastructure projects, transport, broadband. Uh, energy, um, which would otherwise not, if it had not been for this guarantee and if it had not been for the investment fund taking the, f the risk of first loss, would not have secured uh, investment from the private sector. Decisions on which projects to fund will be taken not by the Commission, not by bureaucrats, but by investment experts and um, it will mobilise the expertise that the European Investment Bank already has in this kind of investment procedure. Now, that is a new fund, but it doesn't have an impact on existing EIB funding, which is already available for large infrastructure projects, and will not have a direct impact on, for example, regional funding, um, or on the Connecting Europe facility overall. So there, are, there will be a number of ways in which the Highlands and Islands will be able to access uh, funds to invest in upgrading broadband. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can, yes, please. Yeah, can, on your uh, um, well, my second question is based around the, the, uh, the sort of obvious... Um, difficulties, immediate difficulties, facing the EU generally. Uh, two of them must be the oncoming Greek elections and the possible result. The second is the very high dependence on, on Russian energy, Russian gas, uh, which the tap of, you know, with, with present um, relationships, especially if you look at the sort of Soviet, uh, Russian expansion into Ukraine and difficulties there, um, you're facing a situation where the tap could be turned off. Now, so my question, I suppose, is, does the Commission have a kind of COBRA committee that discusses these issues, which are very relevant and very topical? When do they discuss it? Are the discussions made public? And what is plan B in terms of both of these issues which I have raised? Thank you. <coughs> so, um, on the Greek elections, I think we must see what happens. Uh, I think it is looking likely that Tsaritsa uh, may win. 
they may, under Greek uh, parliamentary law, they will almost certainly have to go into coalition with smaller parties. And interestingly, the smaller parties, PASOK and uh, Potemi, both have made it a condition of any entry into coalition with Syriza that Greek remains a member of the Euro, Greece remains a member of the Euro and a member of the European Union. And again, I think it's not unlike the question that your chairman posed. Until that government is in power and has made clear what its intentions are, it's difficult for the Commission, the European Central Bank, or indeed the IMF, to respond to its demands. Um, the Commission stands ready to discuss with, um, with the incoming Greek government uh, the ways in which it can satisfactorily complete its programme and uh, the ways in which it might need further assistance and the terms on which that assistance would be provided by the Troika. Um, the Commission obviously is keeping a very close eye on what happens in Greece, but I don't think it has anything quite akin to the COBRA committee, um, which is preparing its response in, in, in advance of the outcome of those elections. Um, there are regular meetings between commission officials and Greek officials. The, the review, the, the program continues. The reforms uh, in the Greek administration uh, are still underway in terms of reducing the, um, the size of the public sector um, structural reform in Greece. So I think um, this year Greece is on course for the first time to produce a, a structural surplus. It's, it was projected to have a significant structural surplus in 2015. That may change with an incoming government. But some of the signs were actually rather uh, positive um, at the point when the election was called. So we will have to see what happens. On uh, relations with Russia and energy security... Uh, Vice President Chevchevich was in Moscow last week talking to the Russian authorities. Um, we, the Commission monitors very carefully the winter package that was put in place to assure the Ukraine of continued gas supplies uh, during the season. Overall, that has, has worked fairly well, um, that the tap has not been turned off, supplies have been maintained, there has not been a lot of tension developed around that package. The question is whether a summer package has to be put in place with some funding by which um, the European Union guarantees that Ukraine will, will meet the backlog that has built up in payments for energy to, to Russia, or whether... Um, arrangements between the two countries revert to normal contractual arrangements. That's, that's still an open question, I think, um, and is being discussed in a tripartite way. The longer-term issue of energy security, I think there is no silver bullet. Um, it will be a painstaking work to ensure that uh, interconnectors are built to enable uh, gas from other gas and electricity indeed from other sources to reach those parts of the European Union which are really heavily dependent at present on gas and oil coming um, from Russia, the Russian Federation. So one key issue I think for the energy package which will which is forthcoming will to be will be to look at um, a southern pipeline now that Southern Stream is no longer on the the agenda to create a pipeline that will bring in uh, gas and, and oil from uh, the Middle East to, to the South and Southeastern European uh, countries. The other measures, I think, are also um, interconnecting those countries which have um, lots of renewable energy, and that can be the South, it can be the North, depending upon which renewable source you're talking about, building the interconnectors which enable that energy in the form of electricity to reach those countries which are currently heavily depend dependent on gas and, and coal-fired uh, electricity uh, generation. And also, I think, promoting energy efficiency. Um, Commissioner Chevchevich was in London on Monday, and it's clear that he's very enthusiastic about better ways of... Um, 
heating, for example, community heating projects, which work very well in Sc Scandinavian countries and in some of the Baltic states, um, if they could be used and extended, experience of that could be extended to other member states, uh, that might reduce reliance upon expensive and um, vulnerable energy sources. Well, I don't suppose Greece is that worried about the heating side. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Um, Hans Aller, we've got a quick supplementary and then Rod Campbell. Yes, um, thank you very much and thank you for being here today. It was just a supplementary on the, the energy crisis that we face in Europe and isn't the fact that we're looking at Algeria to plug the gap for gas if push comes to shove? Certainly, I mean, we're also looking across the Mediterranean at ways in which um, both gas but also solar generated um, power could be brought across the Mediterranean. I think the, the big issue facing the European Union is its dependence on single sources of energy. Diversification will make us more secure. And there are two ways of diversifying, either diversifying from uh, internal sources, um, improving the generation from renewables within the member states. Um, certainly, uh, the energy mix can also, in, in some countries, include nuclear. It can include uh, shale. That's one pillar. But the, the, And also making sure that... Um, having generated internally, we then have ways of sharing it optimally because some countries currently have a surplus, others are very dependent upon imports, and we don't have the interconnectors which now enable the surplus to, to be directed to those which, which would need it and could make good use of it. And the other thing is to diversify our external sources of energy, uh, which means, I think, looking to uh, North Africa, um, also looking at, for example, liqui liquefied gas, which can be brought um, a much greater distance from the Middle East, um, and that means probably building the ports in Spain, and then again, building the interconnectors on through the Iberian Peninsula, which will, will take it uh, up to um, France and Yeah, it was the just, uh, the reason why I was asking the question was, or posing the question, <laughs> this uh, sole dependence on the USSR and to try and reduce that um, threat um, that, that's been looked at. And I just wanted to give ourselves a bit of um, breathing space to say, well, there are alternatives and we are exploring them. And that, that was very helpful. Thank you very much. Claude Campbell. Uh, I've got two hopefully very short questions and one a wee bit longer, if that's OK with you. Um, just uh, morning. Uh, in relation to Priority 5, a deeper and fairer economic and monetary union, there's reference to uh, reinforce rules against money laundering. I couldn't see, I appreciate that this work programme is actually for only one year, but there seemed to be much happening possibly in relation to the, the uh, fourth, I think, money laundering directive. Are you able to give me an update on progress in relation to that? I will be frank, I'm not. But I will find the answer out for you and provide you with it in writing. Thank you. OK, uh, moving on to my second brief question. Um, the area of justice and fundamental rights point, there is a reference to uh, respect for the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the fact that the Commission is committed to equality of opportunity for people with disabilities. What's that actually going to mean in practice in the work programme? So um, there is the proposal for... Um, disable access, but I think it's also very much um, a mainstreaming commitment so that in everything that is done, um, we look at the ways in which legislation, the regulatory framework, can ensure that um, disabled persons uh, can enjoy the same benefits, um, uh, and, and that, for example, technical standards are developed in a way which enables disabled persons uh, to make use of, of products on, and, and to uh, ensure that products are safe for their use. Uh, we also, I think, will see more work done on uh, access to the workplace, physical access, but also opportunity access, and um, 
non-discrimination in terms of um, employment rights. So I think there, there will be a realm of uh, a raft of issues coming forward. Um, traditionally, the Commission and the European Union has looked at discrimination. Well, it began by looking at discrimination on grounds of nationality. That then extended to a lot of work on, on grounds of gender discrimination. And now I think it's going to deploy that expertise to look at discrimination on grounds of disability, uh, but also to promote new technologies. A lot of work will be done, I think, in, in um, Horizon 2020 to look at ways of um, providing assisted living uh, so that disabled persons uh, can live independently in the community. Thank you for that. Um, and my final question is in relation to kind of the issue of labour mobility. Um, it's my understanding that the present UK government has concerns about free movement of labour. This particular uh, part in, in relation to the internal market with a strengthened industrial base makes reference to the fact that it's important to support labour mobility, especially in cases of persistent vacancies and skill mismatches, including across borders, while supporting the role of national authorities in fighting abuse or fraudulent claims. Could you just add to that and just tell me a bit more about where the Commission is going with this? Well, um, the Commission has always said that the free movement of persons is one of the four pillars of the single market, alongside free movement of goods, freedom to provide services, and the free movement of capital. And uh, it's evident, and I think the Prime Minister acknowledged this, no, sorry, the Foreign Secretary acknowledged this in a speech yesterday, that some member states um, are confronted by very serious skills shortages and uh, the economic theory underpinning free movement of, of um, persons was always that those skill shortages could be met uh, by people with uh, the necessary qualifications moving from one member state to another. So I think that's reflected in the work programme. Uh, and President Juncker, I think, has on a number of occasions made clear that uh, from the Commission's perspective, free movement of persons is a fundamental right and a fundamental value to which uh, much importance is attached by European citizens. Having said that, um, the Commission recognises that um, any abuse should be confronted uh, and pursued with vigour uh, by, by the member states. And I think we are going to be looking at the legislation to ensure that... Uh, the provisions enable the member states to tackle abuse and also to perhaps put in place measures by way of information sharing, uh, comparing uh, best practice that enable abuse to be tackled more efficiently and effectively. Now, I think there is a separate issue as to changes that the United Kingdom government might want to see in the substantive provisions governing uh, the coordination of social security systems, which the Commission would not necessarily characterise as addressing abuse. Um, I think they're, they're, they're parallel work streams. And I go back to my previous answer, which is um, I think the Commission needs to see detailed proposals from the British government before it can give a detailed response. OK, thank you. OK, Billy Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener, and good morning to you. Um, I wonder if I might try two questions, Convener, if that's possible. One on the digital single market, and the second one on a more general question about how Europe uh, aims to reconnect or connect with its citizens. Um, on the digital single market, Mr Juncker tells us that if we create this digital single market, we can generate 250 billion euros worth of additional growth, creating hundreds of thousands of new jobs. And that's, that's certainly been big on the big things, as you said in your, your opening remarks. But we also know that the infrastructure budget for things like broadband that was mentioned by Jamie McGregor was slashed from about 9 billion to a billion. Um, so the question I have is, how can we have one if we don't have the other? Um, it's a bit like having 
service stations all over Europe, but poor roads linking them, in a sense, to, to try and introduce an analogy. So how can you have that kind of level of investment in the digital single market if we take our eye off the ball on the whole infrastructure that delivers and drives it? Well, um, you're right in that some of the money for to create the guarantee fund, which I referred to earlier in the context of FC, was taken from the Connecting Europe budget. But I don't think that necessarily means, and it's certainly not the Commission's intention, that there should be less funding available uh, for infrastructure, digital infrastructure, um, essentially broadband. The Commission's view is that it, it would be a better use of that money and based on its observation of the market, be a better use of that money to use it to bring in private investment uh, for digital infrastructure than simply to fund it directly by way of grants. Uh, you get, to quote the vernacular, more bang for your buck if you use it by way of guarantee than you do if you use it by way of, uh, of direct financing. There is also, of course, still funding left within the structural funds, which can, in certain circumstances, be used for infrastructure, including um, local broadband. But I think the, the view of the Commission is that um, digital is an area which does attract private investment. There may be some uh, infrastructure which, because of its nature, because it's on the periphery, it's serving rural communities is not as commercially attractive to private investors as cabling a big city would be. But with a little assistance, particularly this first loss assistance, where the Commission would, would well, the, the European Union's guarantee fund uh, would take the first loss, that would be enough to, to bring in the private investors. See, the, the, the risk with that, of course, is that, that remoter communities, not just in Scotland but across Europe, are always last to get the service if it's left to the to the market because the, the rate of return isn't there. And we, we see that in Scotland and we probably see it elsewhere. So from what you said there, do you think there's a counterbalance to that that will try to ensure that that kind of ex digital exclusion doesn't get worse? What FC is trying to do is to improve the return on investment in a way, or to, 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 to return or, or to adjust the risk analysis that uh, an investor would do before, before committing funds, um, so that the, the downside risk for the investor is reduced because they are, they are certain that um, the loss will be, any loss will be incurred first and foremost by the guarantee fund and, and, and not by the private funds. And, and we think, people who are cleverer than I, um, think that that will be enough to push the market in the right direction. And as I say, it's, not the, it, it's one strand, but there are still other strands of more traditional funding that remain. Yeah. Do you want me to answer the other question? Yes, it's about... Um connecting with the ordinary yeah. citizens of, of Europe uh, and how you plan to do that. I mean, if you, look, if you look at the European Parliament's website and indeed the Commission's website, the public-facing website, they're not exactly aimed at the ordinary citizen, in my view. They look as though they're designed by officials and aimed at academics. Um, and we have said at this committee on a number of occasions we need to, Europe needs to think about how it talks to and engages its citizens more, more appropriately. Do you see a need to, to do something like that so that we can counter quite a lot of the negative anti-European coverage that you get in the media, particularly in the UK, uh, where it's all, almost exclusively negative? And do you not see an opportunity in the way that you yourself communicate with the public to make that easier and more accessible for ordinary members of the, the public to access the work that you do? I think certainly the Commission could, could do better in terms of communicating. Um, we're not state-of-the-art by any means. But I think there are a number of considerations. Certainly we can, we can do better in terms of making uh, the information 
more easily accessible, more intuitively accessible to anyone who visits um, our websites. I think there is an awful lot of information on the website. The problem is often finding the page which gives you the detail you want. Uh, and it's frustrating, I think, not only uh, to specialists, to business associations, non-governmental associations, um, national politicians. It can also be quite frustrating uh, to commission officials to find a page on the commission's Europa site that, that uh, you want to direct people to. But work is underway to improve that. More generally, in terms of communicating, I think we have to be realistic. Um, there are 30 people or so in London, four or five people here in Edinburgh. Um, we have to think how we can have the most impact making use of those resources in terms of um, conveying information uh, and improving uh, understanding and knowledge of uh, the British public. And I think quite often the way we can best do it is through intermediaries, partly because the Commission is not a trusted voice in British political discourse. I think that's something that we have to take as a given, at least for some time. Uh, and partly because uh, other voices are more familiar to the British public. So if it is a British or a Scottish business association, a British or a Scottish non-governmental organisation who is saying something about Europe, they can talk in terms uh, that the public will better understand. They know the context, they know their audience, uh, and they will, I think, be more likely to be believed. We cannot change the media. We would not want to change the media. They're perfectly entitled uh, to take their different editorial lines we do quite actively seek to provide them with information, to correct any inaccuracies, and to rebut what we think is unfair comment. But uh, that keeps my four press officers very busy. More generally, I, mean, I think two things. One is um, the Commission needs to take measures to restore trust. One of the things that is in the work programme that it is doing is being more transparent. So all commissioners, their chiefs of staff, directors general, who are the most senior permanent officials, uh, will open their diaries completely. You can see all of the meetings that they have, when and with whom, how long that lasted. And they have now uh, committed also only to meet organisations that are registered in the transparency register. So a member of the public can see who, um, who the organisation is. They can work out from its name maybe what its main interests are, but they can also go to the transparency register and see what it has declared there. But my final point would be um, Europe stands or fall on its record of competence. And I think it has to be able to demonstrate to the citizen that it is doing the things which are of most concern to the citizen, namely securing employment now and in the future, uh, ensuring that European economies return to prosperity, um, looking at the big challenges which confront us environmentally in terms of energy, in terms of an ageing population, uh, and protecting those rights that Europeans have always uh, felt to be crucial and critical, um, tolerance, respect of minorities, and, and very relevantly at the moment, uh, freedom of expression and association. Really quickly. I mean, I, I accept all of that and I agree with all of it, but there's 500 million citizens in Europe that aren't getting that message, and they're certainly not getting it through your website or the European Parliament's website. They're boring, frankly. The European Parliament website, the, the main feature on it today is, are your sausages made with horse meat? <laughs> and, and your website has just got documents flung all over it. And it, if that's the way to engage with the public, I think we need to step up a wee bit here and engage more directly with the kind of messages that you want to give people. Well, we do engage through social media as well. Um, and I 
we we have actually in London just started a big project to completely revamp our website. But that's a, that's a promise. So I hope next time I come back, it will be less boring. Um, I'll try. Thank you very much. Okay, Anne McTaggart. Thank you, convener, okay. and good morning, Ms. Miner. Um, two quick questions, and the first one is: um, Which areas of the work plan are of particular interest to Scotland? For Scotland, I would think obviously the energy uh, union, given um, the, the na nature of the Scottish economy, um, capital markets union, because of the, the strong financial services presence here in Edinburgh. Um, I think as well um, the jobs guarantee, the youth guarantee, because um, although that works through national legislation, it's obviously of great importance to, to young people who are coming out of education maybe without the immediate prospect of finding a job. Um, and I think digital, because um, as, as various of your colleagues have said, digital is a way which enables... Uh, regions which are not at the heart of Europe to have access to the entire 500 million consumers in the European Union. It also enables very small, even micro businesses to have um, a shop window to the entire world, but at least to those 500 consumers. Uh, so it's a way of enabling smaller companies to move into exporting their goods and services very quickly. Thank you. Um, and my second quick question will be um, is about taking these work, some of those work programmes that you've mentioned. Um, how do you envisage them helping to deliver the goals of the Europe 2020? Um, one of the work programme items is, is looking, revising the Europe 2020 goals. This, there was always planned to be a mid-term review of, of the Europe 2020 goals. I don't think there's going to be a fundamental change in the long-term objectives. We're still headed in the same direction, um, more in sustainable, smart, uh, and inclusive growth. Um, what I think this commission may do is perhaps um, reduce the number of indicators. It may also try and um, correlate its work programme with the Europe 2020 goals. So... It will try and fit in the things that it has decided to do, which are posited very much, as I said at the beginning, on the on President Juncker's personal manifesto. Um, it will adjust those to um, the Europe the, the Europe 2020 uh, template. So I, I don't think you know it's it's almost steady as she goes in terms of Europe 2020. Although we know we're not in the place we would like to be at this halfway point. Uh, but all that we can do is continue to strive to get uh, closer to those goals. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Convener. Thank you very much. Adam Ingram. I'm concerned about that last answer because I thought I would have thought the Commission should be driving towards the 2020 vision, which is, envisages things like full employment and, and the like, and the work programme ought to be engineered to deliver that. So that. That seems to me to be the logical way to go about it. The other aspect of uh, I wanted to query with you was how joined up is the work programme? Now, clearly, uh, improving energy security and creating jobs and growth are eminently linkable, and the investment programme that you've laid out there uh, are the 315 billion euros, a big, a big sum of money, uh, could be focused on, for example, some strate European strategic-wide energy initiatives so that would create jobs. Could you tell me, <coughs> is that part of the, the, the big picture? Is that part of what we're aiming to do over the next few years? Okay. Um, in relation to your initial remarks, I must apologise because I perhaps wasn't as clear as I ought to have been in replying to the previous question. What I had intended to, to, to convey was that the Commission really... The priorities in, of this Commission are very similar to the priorities in 
uh, Europe 2020. It's just that they're formulated according to a different template. But the whole thrust of the work program is to concentrate on things which will drive job creation, growth, and competitiveness. So I think there there is no difference between um, the two sets of objectives. In terms of being joined up, I go back again to the structure of the commission. It's very much intended to be a more joined up commission so that the, the whole of the policy agenda is driven by the college um, and is top down. It's the, the members of the college, the commissioners themselves, who decide the direction of policy and that this isn't being driven by um, the services. I would not, of course, say this, but there are some people who say that um, officials have their own agendas and tend to drive forward uh, proposals that they've been working on for a long time. I'm sure that never happened in the Commission. But it certainly won't be happening in the future. Um, and also the way of working, these kind of interlocking project teams, the aim is to ensure that there's a read across from each of these big initiatives to the others. So, for example, in the energy package, there will also be a list of the, the, the key infrastructure proposals um, that are planned to be, to be funded by the regional fund, the Connecting Europe facility. And that is parallel to infrastructure um, projects which might be eligible for FC funding. Now, in terms of the funds, that, the, the projects which will be funded by FC, um, there is already a list of pipeline projects that are grouped together under uh, energy, digital infrastructure, research and development, transport infrastructure, I think. Um, not all of them. That list is not a guarantee of funding through the European Fund for Strategic Investment. It's also um, not being on the list doesn't mean you won't get funding. But it's indicative of the kinds of fund, uh, kinds of project that FC is intended to drive financing towards. So I think, in short, to answer your question, joining up policies is going to be definitely one of the things that the Commission wants to improve. And I think the way it has been set up is conducive to doing that. Yes, the other aspect of joining up uh, various initiatives is, is in terms of delivering a, a, or a strategic direction for, um, let's say, for energy security, for example. Um, Scotland is obviously very important to Europe, um, given the North Sea, given the, um, the renewable resources that we, we have here. So I would expect Europe would be looking to actually invest money in, uh, in Scotland in terms of, um, say, cap carbon capture and storage, for example. We've got uh, uh, all the infrastructure that we need for, 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 for a demonstration project, for example, in the North Sea with the oil fields. Um, it could be in terms of um, an investment in uh, wave and tidal power. Now, the feedback that we've been getting is that it's the Scottish Government are being limited in what they can do because of European <coughs> state aid rules in terms of investment in these new technologies. Um, can we expect a different approach uh, over the next few years in terms of the development of renewable technologies and the, the ability of the Scottish Government, the UK Government uh, and others to invest in the technology of the future that will deliver us clean energy? The, um, the energy union, which I think is, is likely to be tabled in the next month or so, one of the five dimensions of the communication will certainly be research and development, and it will be looking at ways in which we can encourage um, greater investment in research in clean technologies, sustainably technologies. Now, I think it's premature to speculate as to whether that would look at the existing state aid rules or not. But I know 
again from having accompanied the Commissioner um, during discussions in London earlier in the week, that he's very enthusiastic about carbon capture and storage, and he feels very strongly that um, in the run-up to Paris, for example, Europe uh, has to show leadership in terms of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and one of the ways it can do that is by demonstrating that clean technologies and green technologies are an area which is um, really helpful for growth and um, future competitiveness. So I think the message has been heard in Brussels. Um, you will obviously want to examine how that translates into the policy documents on energy union and make your views clear. Well, in term, I'm sorry, convener, just a, a brief, you right. Well, in terms of actually being able to deliver something like that, um, uh, what I was talking about, does it require, um, is there a bit of pork barrel politics involved in delivering that? Uh, every every um, member state has to get a piece of the action or is there a recognition of the strategic importance of this for the whole of Europe? So an individual member state um, doesn't uh, need to, um, you, know, you know, push the boat out on this. This will actually be uh, gather support more widely. I think there is that recognition, yes, that these... Um these projects have to be of common European interest. They have to have a European dimension, and that means that there is not an allocation by member state. Um, and one of the ways, in, one of the concerns about the ways in which the fund is being set up and administered, is to try and ensure that the focus is on the viability of the project and the interest of the project, and not the overall split of the funds, um, so to take it away from a, a kind of intergovernmental perspective into a European one. Thank you. Okay, as you can see, <laughs> there is many aspects of the work programme that, that it, you know, hold the interest of individual committee members as well as the, the overall committee. I know that some other members wanted to be quick supplementaries, but we do have another agenda item to get through, and if they want out of here for half eleven, then we have to be quite strict on that. But w would you mind that if members have other questions, that we feed them through our clerking team, then we could we could send them on to you and maybe seek some written responses to those? I'm ha very happy to do that. And uh, I haven't forgotten the question on money laundering, so I'll, I'll make sure I find out about I, that. He won't allow you to forget it either. <laughs> very committed. Can I say thank you very much? We, it was a real pleasure to have you at committee today, and we, we hope that this is the first of many times that you can come and share your, uh, your wealth of experience and understanding of um, what it all means um, as far as the UK and especially Scotland goes. So thank you very much, thank and, and thank you to your team for thank the you. ongoing support too. Thank you. You're, you're more than welcome to, to remain with us in the, the public gallery for a while because we're going through the Brussels Bulletin. So um, the next agenda item is the Brussels Bulletin. Um, and as you can see, we have less than six minutes uh, to get through. So if you have comments, questions or clarifications on the Brussels Bulletin, then please um, give me those now. Billy Coffee. Convener, I, yeah, thanks very much. Um, do you recall at uh, previous meetings where uh, some of the members had requested more summary information about the kind of investments that the European Union is making in particular areas, and for us to ask for a wee summary of that to be perhaps attached to this document? Uh, is there ever going to be any sight of that in the bulletin itself, or would that be something separate that we would have to ask to be given to the committee? So I think it's important that we can see some of the beneficial positive programmes that Europe is driving and delivering, particularly for Scotland, but for elsewhere too. Yeah. That would be very helpful. I think that might be additional, but we can certainly chase that up for you again and just see what's happening. It may be the break over Christmas and things have pushed the, the timeline on that a wee bit. Thank you. Yeah, certainly. Thank you. Jamie McGregor. Um, just on the broadband uh, heading on page six, which notes that the UK is head of the EU average, 
across all technology combinations. Um, however, in rural areas, the situation is significantly different to the national picture. I mean, I think that's the point here. Uh, I mean, it's all very well painting a rosy picture, um, but the, the, the actual facts of the matter are, are, are strictly different. And what is happening is that little deserts are being created in, in, in the UK, um, and particularly in Scotland, rural areas, uh, which then find themselves at distinct advantage, particularly in tourism terms. And that's the point I'd like to make. And I, th I think, you know, it's like rolling out, if you rolled out telephones, I mean, telephones used to, every house, you know, had a telephone rolled out. Why can't every house have fibre optic, you know, fibre optics? But certainly, you know, given, given the, the keen interest of, the, of this committee on the matter and the, the, the many times it has been raised and, and now the, the renewed focus from the Commission, it's maybe something specifically we should write to the Commission on asking you know, them to look at specific areas like the ones you've described, Jamie. Well, that, I think, I think you, 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 you run the risk of, of, of creating an unfair society, uh, uh, you know, through this. So yeah. That's what worries me. Well, why don't we do that? We raise that specifically with All right, the Commission, please. that yeah. specific yeah. issue. Yeah. And I was going to actually ask if that could be included in the questions to, to the Commissioner. We certainly can do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Hans Allen. Yeah, that was uh, a question that I also <laughs> had in mind. Um, it was m more in line of what advice you could offer us in terms of us trying to pursue this issue. Uh, digital broadband uh, not being rolled out uh, is disadvantaging people, disadvantaging your trade and industry, it's disadvantaging your art, crafts and culture. I mean, the, the, the disadvantages are boundless, and I think, therefore, uh, it drives home the importance of broadband being rolled out and the idea about suggesting that it's open to uh, companies to, to um, try to make ends meet. I think it's not good enough if they, if they can cherry-pick large cities and make large sums of monies then I think there needs to be a bit of responsibility in terms of what percentage of what needs to be done in rural areas as well. I think we need a strategy for this, and uh, I would really wish that we, we really need to put that in place. Now, we've talked about it for nearly two years now, but I don't, still don't see any, any end to this discussion, so we really need to do something about it now. Okay, there's, there's a few um, elements to that. There's the, the UK government and the rollout of 3G and 4G. There's the Scottish government and their funding and rollout of broadband. And then there's the European, the, the European yeah. aspect to yeah. that. So why don't we have um, a, almost like a supply chain uh, type of letter going where we're, we're seeking some clarification for the Scottish government on the, pro, the, pro, the progress they have made with the UK government and therefore the progress they've made with the EU? As well, yes. Yeah. I think that would be helpful, too. Okay. Okay. Any more for the Brussels Bulletin? Billy. Thank you, Mayor. Just, could I just possibly add to that the time we have left? I mean, there, there is a, a really good initiative in Scotland to roll out superfast broadband, not only to the urban communities, but to the highland and rural communities as well. But I'm thinking of it more in a European context. If, if you looked at the position right across Europe, it would be quite a variable picture you would see in the member states in terms of super fast speeds available in each of these countries. And I was thinking that the digital single market might want to embrace that much more clearly to, to kind of level that out and lift, lift standards and speeds, if you like, right across Europe. And that's where I think perhaps an opportunity is being missed by taking such a, a, a cut to the infrastructure, the broadband infrastructure budget in Europe. So I think it's an opportunity missed, but I'd still like to see a kind of European perspective on this and how it sees this developing. You know. Okay, we've got all of that. Okay, thank you uh, very much. The next meeting will be on the 5th of February, where we will take evidence from the Deputy First Minister on the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which is our ongoing inquiry. So I look forward to seeing you then, and thank you very much for your attendance this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Close the meeting.